Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today we're going to be looking at part two of our Fast Attack series, taking a look at the modern submarine simulator Fast Attack, published by Sierra Games back in the late 1990s. As I said in my previous video, this is one of my favorite games of all time, and also I believe one of the best modern day submarine simulators. So we're in the Persian Gulf campaign, which is where the um, single player campaign begins. Um, there's different mission sets, and the Persian Gulf is the first one you do in the uh, campaign game. And um, we're in the second mission. So the first mission, there were three Iranian merchant ships carrying WMDs and other uh, supplies, which we considered illegal, which we sank. Uh, in this one, our goal here is to sink two Iranian fast attack craft, the Sahid and Zobun. Uh, satellite imagery indicates targets are located... Northeast of current position, U.S. naval vessels in the area are currently searching offshore oil, offshore oil platforms and will assist an attack once the search is complete. Uh, basically, um, the enemy is using mines and fast attack craft to attack merchant ships in the area. Now, this actually closely mirrors uh, reality. As I said, this um, campaign is taking place in the 1980s. Uh, it is uh, 19... 88. I missed the date there. Uh, currently in the game, so in real life in 1988, the United States was busy uh, trying to keep oil supplies flowing from the Middle East, um, and by doing this, they ended up having to place military vessels as escorts to uh, oil ships because the Iranians are basically threatening to close the Hormuz Straits, which leads into the Persian Gulf and has a great deal of the world's oil supply pass through it. So. In this mission, there is an enemy frigate-guided missile and an enemy patrol boat, um, which are basically our targets here. So it's it's not an exactly realistic mission. You know, this isn't based on any specific operation that occurred, um, although the U.S. military did engage Iranian forces uh, in the 1980s uh, on numerous occasions um, to keep the oil oil supplies flowing. But as I said, this is not based on a historical scenario specifically, but it is based on just sort of, it's kind of, kind of like an alternate history. This could have happened um, if things had played out differently here. So, um, kind of enough of my brief synopsis here. We've got one enemy target here in sight. Uh, we know there's two enemy targets. We are currently at, I believe, 150 feet of depth is what I adjusted us up to. Um, I'm going to be making these attacks without going to periscope depth or anything along those lines. Uh, in the case of the first target, it's over 20 nautical miles away, so definitely not something I'd be able to see from uh, periscope depth anyway. Now, as I said, I'm playing this game with relatively easy difficulty. Um, I'm not really playing it at the hardcore level, so a lot of this stuff is just uh, more arcade-like. What you see me doing right now is plotting out the... Um, harpoon range to to target basically I'm looking at firing a harpoon anti-ship missile at my target and I am uh, plotting out the range and then sending the range to uh, one of the harpoons in my tubes right now and I'm gonna go ahead and fire this first one at the first of my two targets as I said in the easier difficulty that I have the game set on you actually get a pretty accurate uh, plot of the enemy uh, position so firing things like harpoons and torpedoes is much easier at this level of the game than in future levels of the game, um, or in higher difficulty levels of the game, um, because your plot's already pretty accurate there. And as you see, I'm leading the target there. That little green line represents where the enemy's been and where he's headed to. So I'm leading the enemy target, uh, basically shooting my missile to an area where I think the enemy will be, not where they are right now. Essentially the way the harpoon missile works is once it leaves the submarine and takes off, it goes into searching mode after a certain period of time. So you basically set your missile to go a certain designated distance at which point it will turn on its homing head and begin searching for enemy uh, targets. Uh, the thing with a harpoon missile is it is not a smart missile. Well it is, but it isn't. It's a missile that uses radar to home in on a target but it is not smart in the sense that anything it sees it considers a target. It can't differentiate between a friendly oil platform and an enemy uh, fast attack craft. So, um, you know, we're obviously in the middle of one of the most heavily trafficked regions in the world. 
So you got to be careful with your targets. You got to be pretty accurate with them, or they're just not going to hit where you want them to hit. And this game definitely models you hitting the wrong targets. So you want to make sure that you're relatively accurate. As I said, it's easier on easy difficulty here uh, to do that and not have to worry as much. But we've also only got a few harpoons. We've only got six there in the tubes. We've got one in the air. That's five left on the boat. Um, and we're definitely looking to use harpoons against these enemy enemy uh, vessels here. Um, but here we go. It's been a little bit uh, over a minute and a half since we launched it. We've got that estimated time to target as we ready these other uh, torpedo tubes here. Um, they are all loaded with UGM-84s. That's the harpoon. Uh, the harpoon is one of the most versatile anti-ship missiles in the world right now. It's very... I'd put it on par with the Exocet, uh, the French anti-ship missile. Um, in the sense that it can be fired from torpedo tubes, it gets put in a, a small casing and gets shot out with compressed air. It heads to the surface, at which point the casing breaks off and the rocket motor is engaged uh, above water. Um, it can be fired from an aircraft uh, along a pylon of an aircraft and fired in midair, and it can be fired from a ship. So it's a very versatile missile, like I said, much like the French Exocet. Here you can see that missile was incoming. I skipped through that first cutscene, and there you see it detonating on the enemy frigate guided missile. So it looks like a critical hit. Uh, as I've said in the previous video, when you get one of those cutscenes, it's a critical hit. It means the target that you hit is going to be destroyed. So you can turn those cutscenes on and off. It'll kind of minimize the gaminess of, uh, of the game, if you will. Um, as I cut over here to Sonar, um, you can see here we've got our track here, the number one track, uh, which is the frigate. Um, it looks like it's getting a little bit quieter and quieter, so I would imagine that's simulating the engines being cut off and maybe the ship bringing, you know, becoming dead in the water as it slowly sinks. Um, it's giving off less and less uh, noise, and as you can see there, we went ahead and we lost contact on the enemy vessel. Um, we're not using active sonar, we're using passive sonar, as I've mentioned before, so you can only hear what's put in the, the water. You cannot actually... If a, if a target's sitting dead in the water and not making any noise, you won't hear it. Um, basically, you're sticking a microphone in the water and listening. So, we destroyed that first target. I'm um, bringing us up a bit here. I want to bring us up to about 150 feet, see if maybe if we get closer to the surface we can see any, hear any other ships. Because um, as we know, we've got two targets here. We've only destroyed one of them. Um, we'll see here as we bring it up a little bit more. Not really going to talk about the layer in this video. I'll talk about that a little bit more in future videos here. Um, but... Uh, Iran was also the Iran, Iranian conflicts between the U.S. and Iran in the late, na late 1980s was also one of the few times that American uh, naval vessels were able to engage in combat. Uh, most U.S. conflicts, uh, you know, land forces, air forces, they get a lot of exercise and ground support and fighting enemy troops. But the U.S. Navy hasn't had a whole lot of competition or engagements. There's been a few, but not a whole lot since really... Uh, World War II. There were a few in Vietnam, a few, I believe, few, a few in Korea. Um, and really, I think Iran and maybe Libya. Although I'm pretty sure the conflicts with Libya in the 80s were primarily air conflicts. Um, the conflict with Syria, with Iran, Iran during the um, Persian Gulf campaigns in the late 1980s really involved actual ship-to-ship -ship missile use, um, which is something that really hadn't been done a whole lot of uh, previous. Um, there had been engagements. I think the Falkland Wars are probably a pretty prevalent example of missiles versus ships, although not really ships versus ships, air-launched anti-ship missiles, the Exocet against the British Navy here. As you can see here, I'm trying to find the enemy target. Usually on easy difficulty, it just pops up on you, so probably isn't there, but I'm just quickly running through all the different targets to see if anything that I can pick up right now is the target I'm looking for. Um, but it doesn't appear to be so. I saw two friendly naval vessels and uh, a couple of uh, neutrals, which obviously we don't want to sink. Uh, so the TB-16 wasn't sufficient. We're going to go ahead and stow that, and then we're going to deploy the TB-23. Um, now, we'll wait for that. That takes a few moments here. We'll jump ahead a little bit till I uh, detect this target. All right, here we go. The TB-23 is now deployed, and we've got multiple contacts. As you can see, there are just more and more sounds that we're picking up streaming in through our sonar. So 
Um, there we've got a uh, a target, and that's the Zobun. It's a Comanti 2 missile corvette. Um, so we picked that up. This scenario actually reminds me a lot of a historical operation which did occur in the Persian Gulf. I've been kind of referencing some of those that did occur, but the one I'm thinking of, the operation was called Operation Praying Mantis, and it took place in... April of 1988. Now, I believe, like I said earlier, we are in 1987 right now. But in the engagement, the U.S. Navy with the surface warships sank a, uh, surface and air units, sank a enemy, a Iranian uh, frigate, uh, guided missile, and an Iranian uh, missile boat, as well as three f armed speedboats. I'm not sure if the Kamagachi 2 would count as a gun, as a missile boat or as a speedboat. I'm not quite sure where the definition lies. But essentially, sank those two two a missile guided uh, corvette, basically a uh, frigate and a couple of smaller vessels, as well as damaging another frigate. Um, in actual ship to ship engagements, I don't believe there were any submarines involved, but um, there were definitely naval assets involved in ship to ship fighting, as well as air units involved um, with some airstrikes as well. Um, all taking place around some oil platforms with the Iranians. We're also using delay mines and things like that. So this particular mission fits that entire scenario very plausibly and could easily have been uh, what had occurred if a U.S. submarine had been in the area instead of uh, naval naval forces. Um, here you see me kind of adjusting my approximated enemy course, range, and speed. Uh, essentially this is where you're going to set up a fire control solution on an enemy vessel. Um, essentially what you want to do is you want to get that line, that dotted line that advances as the enemy advances, right down the line there, right down that middle center line there, and you can increase speed, course, or um, heading uh, settings all in an attempt to um, get your fire control solution to be more accurate. So as you see here, the enemy continues to uh, control, come head straight down that line. So that basically tells me that I've got a pretty solid fire control solution so far. Um, on this enemy target, uh, they're a little bit too far out of range to do a passive or act, or sorry, an active sonar session to kind of get an idea of where they're at here. But as you can see, like I said, we've got a a straight target right down the line here. Um, definitely looks good. I'm just waiting a little bit to make sure that it doesn't change. If they start changing course, if I go ahead and hit enter there and it seems to fall off center, then I need to make some corrections. But at this point, looks like I've got a good fire control solution on here for my harpoon missiles, uh, which I already used to take out the first enemy patrol craft. I will be using it on the second patrol craft uh, before too long. Um, hit enter there, everything still seems right on line. Um, send the information to the harpoons, uh, open the outer door, arm my vessel or arm my missile and watch the cutscene as the missile gets shot. As I said, it, it's kind of in like a, a torpedo like casing gets shot out there and then it heads toward the surface. When it gets up toward the surface it breaks away, the rocket motor ignites and the actual solid rocket fueled uh, harpoon missile launches out there. Now you see I'm launching at quite a distance, over 30 nautical miles. The harpoon has a pretty good range, um, but that's still a, a very long range missile shot. You know, it's over a three minute long flight, which does not seem like it's, you know, a huge distance or a huge uh, time to wait. But um, given the fact that the enemy vessel is moving at over 30 knots and is over 30 nautical miles away, that's a lot of time to cover. So if your, your solution is off um, by even just a little bit, um, you're, you're going to miss your target, and with, with all these oil rigs and other things like that in the nearby areas, you're probably going to hit something you don't want it to hit. Your, your missile has a radar homing head. It doesn't know if it's missed its target. It just knows what looks like a target on its radar, and uh, if, it, uh, if it picks something up that you don't want it to hit, well, there's really no way for you to know uh, until it detonates, and that's a 488-pound explosive warhead uh, with contact detonation, so that can do quite a bit of damage. It's not as big as some of the Russian anti-ship missiles, but it's it's definitely a, a mammoth weapon. Uh, the harpoon, it's an interesting it's an interesting weapon. It's a sea skimming missile that's designed to be fired, and it uh, basically it, it flies very very low to the ground to a preset destination where it pops up, searches for a target, and then will hit it. Um, it can be used, as I said, from submarines, from ships, from aircraft. I, I did also forget to mention, it can also be used for um, land or coastal missile defense systems. 
uh, the Danish Navy, for example, uses uh, the harpoon um, in a coastal missile defense system. So it can be used for uh, area denial as well. Um, it's probably the most popular, most produced anti-ship missile. I may be wrong there. Let me double check real quick. It's had over 7,000 weapons produced. Um, I don't have a figure on the Exocet. But the Exocet has been produced continuously since uh, 1979. It was designed in the 1960s. The Harpoon's been produced since 1977. Um, so actually, the Exocet appears to be an older design but not older in terms of how long it's been manufactured. It began, well actually yeah, it did begin production in 74, I'm sorry, three years early. So anyway, uh, enough of my rambling here. The Exocet's probably the most famous because of the, the Argentine War. It's probably been used more than any other anti-ship missile in actual combat. Um, but the Harpoon has been used from surface vessels against other surface vessels. I'm not sure how often the Exocet really has. As you see there, the enemy uh, ship progressed through that little circle in the middle. That's kind of the ideal point. You want the enemy target to be right in the middle of there. But it doesn't look like the target's changed course or anything like that. So 35 seconds, uh, maybe if the, the Harpoon turns its seeker head on a little bit early. I believe the way that that works is right there where that straight line turns into kind of like a cone. That's where the missile goes active, and that's basically telling you anywhere in that cone it can detect. Now the ideal detection distance is going to be that circle, but anywhere inside that cone, you see right here, it can detect and hit. So hopefully we should still have a good enough solution. The enemy ship is still definitely way inside that, uh, inside that block there as we approach the timed impact. Now, our harpoon has been fired at about half of its maximum distance, but for a submarine-launched harpoon, that's a pretty long range, as I already said. Over 30 nautical miles away. But that's a good sign here, as we've got a incoming missile. There's the harpoon as it flies toward its target. Uh, and there's the enemy vessel. That's the vessel we wanted to hit. So that's a good sign there. Right there it explodes. So this enemy vessel is gone. Uh, that missile boat is a very small boat. The frigate we destroyed first, that might have been a more challenging target to destroy with just one hit. But uh, we must have gotten a pretty good hit on, on the water line there to cause it to go under and maybe caused a magazine explosion. That small boat doesn't stand much of a chance, though. It's not going to do very well against a, a missile. Um, so I expect to hear it sinking. And there we go. We lost contact on it, so it's drifting out of contact. Likely means it's already sunk. A vessel like that with a 500 pound explosion on it, also considering that it's got multiple missiles of its own on there, that vessel probably nearly vaporized when it was hit. Um, so that's definitely definitely a good thing. I'm going to go ahead and stow the floating, uh, so floating sonar, which is really what a, a towed array sonar is. So there you hear we destroyed the enemy target. Our mission was successful now, and, and now basically it's just an issue of returning to base. So there you go, we're ending our mission there, and you can see we got 100% of our primary goals, both ships, none of our secondary goals, which was basically finding some mines, which I'm terrible at, so I didn't try. We'll go ahead and review, you can see all the pertinent details of what happened, there's our ship's log. Um, pretty detailed there, telling you basically every everything you do, every time you change something in your, uh, in your ship, it shows up there. Um, those critical hits show up in red. Um, and everything looks, you know, pretty good here at this point. So uh, it was a successful mission, and the next mission um, is going to be another interesting one. I'll talk a little bit more in the next mission about kind of pros and cons of harpoons versus torpedoes, and at some point I'd like to get into some actual details about the towed sonar arrays and how those work. Um, but for the meantime, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. This was episode two of my Fast Attack series. And uh, if you like this, or if you'd like me to change anything about how I do this, maybe talk more about actual weapon systems capabilities and less about the game, I'm sure I'll get into that more in the later episodes once we kind of are more worn and used, you know, more used to the mechanics of the game. But uh, anyway, that's that's all I have for you here today. Until next week on the second of, or sorry, the first of November is when my next episode should be up. This is the Historical Gamer signing out.